evening, everyone, and um, welcome to a NIM webinar on sleep. Um, as many of you would know, sleep is a very uh, common issue uh, in the community, and many patients will come to see their doctor or psychologist, mental health professional, um, wanting some answers and wanting some strategies about how to manage that, and in particular, um, strategies that are non-pharmacological. Uh, so tonight we, um, we have uh, two experts in this field um, and uh, I'd just like to welcome um, Dr. Sandra Parson, who um, is an integrative GP here at NIM, and also um, David um, Morowitz, who is a sleep specialist and uh, a counselling psychologist who has done a lot of work in this area. So perhaps we might start with uh, with Sandra. I know that um, you've prepared a presentation for us this evening and um, looking at um, your approach to supporting patients with regard to sleep problems. No, <clears throat> thank you. Um, look, thank you for joining us this evening to discuss the importance of <clears throat> deep healing sleep. Are we all good? Um, we're, just, we're having a few technical issues, I'm afraid. So we're just waiting for the uh, PowerPoint to load. And I can manage without that, so that's fine. So um, I'd like to start talking this evening. I mean, most patients I see, we bring up the issue of sleep, a very important part of, of healthcare. And more and more, um, I'm interested in recent research about the glymphatic system. It's only happened since 2015 that we've found out about the glymphatic system. Prior to this, we did not know that the brain had a lymphatic system, certainly not when I went through medicine. So the lymphatic system is of importance in draining toxins each night as we sleep. In fact, the interstitial fluid in the brain actually decreases by up to 60% to drain the toxins of the day. And this is um, much more common during deep delta sleep in the early part of our sleep cycle. From 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. seems to be the optimal time for this to occur. <clears throat> now, research is showing that we need apparently one to two hours of deep delta sleep a night. And deep delta sleep is the one to four hertz sleep. So you can measure it. And it's best monitored by a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, um, only to be used occasionally, of course, um, because of uh, EMF issues. Now, just to note here that this is nothing to do with sleep apnea. That's a uh, medical condition that needs um, a clinical, it was a clinical condition that requires a sleep study and specific treatment. So we're not talking about sleep apnea, which is best measured during the sleep study. So less and less people are getting deep healing sleep, uh, which is proving more and more essential to health. Um, in fact, I remember a patient recently who said, well, I'll be fine, I sleep all night. But when he wore a Fitbit, he only ended up uh, having about 20 minutes of deep delta sleep. So lack of deep sleep has been um, noted in mood disorders, uh, migraines, obesity, heart disease, and could prove to be a major problem in the development of Alzheimer's and dementia. It appears that it's also very difficult to reduce inflammation in the body without deep delta sleep. And inflammation, of course, is a major factor in the development of most chronic illnesses and diseases, uh, including cancers. And shift workers are another group that do struggle to get enough deep sleep. And, um, you know, there is normally a use-by time for shift workers because the health problems do seem to be related to the um, lack of deep delta sleep, I'm beginning to think, as well as the imbalance in their circadian rhythm. Um, so now to advise us some measures we can all use to deepen our sleep. Sleep hygiene is extremely important, and I know David has a lot to talk about here but I'll just, a few notes that I've found helpful. The bedroom needs to be cool, um, hopefully with access to fresh air. I think this is important. And if this isn't possible, I think some people are starting to use air filters and there are some good ones on the market. The room needs to be so dark, you can't see your hand in front of your eyes and blackout curtains and eye masks can be helpful if it isn't possible. It's most important to go to bed and wake up at nearly the same time each day even at weekends. And I find if you need to sleep longer, I suggest you go to bed earlier rather than interfere too much with the waking time. Um, I think it's important to try and not eat for three hours before bed. 
So if you're going to bed about 10 p.m., you know, basically 7 p.m. is a good time to have finished your evening meal um, and only a light meal if possible. I think research is showing, and the Chinese medical practitioners are excellent when they tell us our digestion is strongest in the middle of the day. And I think we should be, if possible, trying to eat our main meal of the day in the middle of the day. Uh, of course, not always possible with um, family life as it is at present with school, work, etc. But something to be thought about. There is a particular situation where some people do wake up at 2 or 3 a.m. because of low blood sugar. And I mean, this can be checked uh, with blood levels, but maybe a light snack before bed would be helpful for these people. Maybe turkey, bananas, foods which contain tryptophan, which can help with sleep. Alcohol is best not taken if you have any trouble sleeping and caffeine shouldn't be taken after midday if there are sleeping problems. Most people find a midday stop is the best. It appears best to turn off all screens in the evening. Um, not always possible, but if, if you can do that early on, but use a red filter or the special glasses that are easily available on Amazon and aren't expensive at all. There should be no screens in the bedroom, no phones, nothing like that, and hopefully a central Wi-Fi switch which can be turned off at night. Now, when you wake up in the morning, it's important to access bright sunlight as soon as you can. Um, of course, in winter, it's not always um, possible. There are special um, alarm clocks, I believe, that do show a natural dawn happening in the bedroom, which can be very helpful if you don't have access to uh, bright sunlight. Of course, they might be a bit expensive. But I think the bright sunlight possible, is possible to sort of help support our circadian rhythm, which we're finding as we live in city life that our circadian rhythm is getting quite out of balance. This is where we keep more time with the moon cycles rather than just the Gregorian calendar. Most people in the city don't even know what's happening with the moon, although we have had a beautiful moon just recently. I think most people are aware of that. So melatonin peaks at 2 to 4 a.m. and cortisol is at its highest at 6 a.m. And this is what we mean by managing our circadian rhythm. Uh, what's the best way to promote those uh, levels? And of course, cortisol is lowest at midnight. Melatonin is made by the pineal gland in the center of our brain, and it's released in response to darkness. And there is evidence that spending as much time out of doors as possible um, helps us to sleep better. I think it's something we really need to um, get into sort of more, what would I say, a regular practice being out of doors. Working indoors all day isn't very um, conducive to good health long term. So grounding, walking barefoot on healthy ground or at the beach can reduce positive ions which build up with the more time we spend indoors. And of course, um, being out of doors helps to increase the negative ions, such as when we're around a waterfall, we all feel better in, in those beautiful outdoor, outdoor spaces and it definitely has an effect on our health. In Japan, um, people are advised to do forest bathing, which is actually just hanging out in nature, enjoying ourselves without doing anything. And I often think of people just putting headphones on and running around without perhaps even noticing where they are. I think they're missing some of the benefits. Um, outdoor exercise is, of course, important. I think it's preferable to indoors at the gym. There's been some evidence that gyms can be quite um, toxic because there's often air conditioning. There's lots of rubber, apparently, from all the um, exercise equipment being used. And uh, so it's interesting to think that maybe outdoor exercise, things like Tai Chi, yoga, Qigong, or just enjoying being out of doors walking, swimming may be a more effective form of exercise than just purely being in the gym and again locking ourselves indoors. So to help reset the circadian rhythm, I found camping is, is such a good idea. Um, sleeping on the ground, waking up with the sun, going to bed with the sun, even a weekend's camping can really help to reset the circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. So now just a few tools to help us um, sleep a bit better. As poor sleep can be a symptom of many chronic medical illnesses, I would advise a check up with your health professional first to rule out things like iron deficiency, thyroid imbalance, blood sugar problems, et cetera, and to check the effects certain medica medications might be having on your sleep. Um, personally, I think vitamin D is one of the most important tests. I recommend 5,000 units daily in Melbourne in winter, as we are too far away from the equation at the wrong angle of the sun to get enough vitamin D from purely sun exposure. 
So Melbourne and Tasmania, Victoria and Tasmania have always needed a vitamin D supplement. In the past, we took cod liver oil, but as most people these days no longer take cod liver oil, a vitamin D supplement I think is most important. Um, the blood levels can be checked to ensure optimal dosage. And vitamin D is important in helping to balance our calcium levels, and calcium, of course, helps our muscles to relax. The second test or the second supplement I like to use is magnesium. This is a very important supplement as it's very low in the soils in Australia and it's also hard to test for as only there's only one or two percent in our serum. We can do red blood cell magnesium levels uh, but of course um, that red blood cells only live for three months so I would recommend 400 to 600 milligrams daily of maybe magnesium glycinate as a basic magnesium. There are many other different ones if that's difficult to get. But as well, I recommend magnesium l 3 onate 100 milligrams at night, as it is the only magnesium to go through the blood-brain barrier. And there is a lot of research showing it can be very effective in helping with sleep, particularly deep. And I do recommend an Epsom salt bath at night with magnesium chloride added as well, Epsom salts um, is magnesium sulfate, and you can get magnesium chloride crystals as well. Uh, lavender oil, you know, it's a lovely way to have a salt lamp on and listen to lovely music and just relax, and it definitely does help to improve sleep. For children, I find it uh, an Epsom salt bath wonderful, and I also recommend magnesium oil to rub on the soles of feet if people don't like the, it can be a little bit irritant on the skin, but it's often well absorbed through the soles of your feet. And other tests I like to do are for cortisol and melatonin, salivary tests I think are the best way. Definitely high cortisol at night, which we can pick up from the test directly depletes melatonin levels. And so if we do have high cortisol at night, it's going to be really important to do health practices to reduce that. Um, meditation and mindfulness can be very effective to reduce stress and high cortisol levels. And um, one thing I've found particularly helpful is thought field therapy and emotional freedom technique. This is a form of tapping. Um, it's tapping basically on different points on our face and upper body that actually take us from fight or flight down into more healing um, parasympathetic modules, which turns on our heal and repair. And there's a lot of research in the States and in Europe to support the use of this tapping um, it does reduce cortisol by up to 43%, and they've used it with great success in veterans with PTSD. So there's a lot of research to support the effectiveness. And if you go onto YouTube, you'll find many um, free sort of access to many. Um, you just tap in, I guess, tap in, or do tapping for sleep reduction, and you'll find a lot of support there. There's also free YouTube sequences as well as calming music in the theta range, which is the four to eight hertz range, and delta, which is the one to four, hertz, one to four hertz range. And I find these, this can be very um, calming. So um, it's wonderful how easy it is to access these tools and it's all quite uh, free. Herbal teas are very helpful. I like chamomile, lemon balm, sleepy time tea, and there's many others that, that people enjoy. And I think we need to um, use all of these things in the evening. Uh, now then, some natural supplements to help deepen sleep. Um, I find a very good one is 5-HTP, which is um, a form of tryptophan, 50 milligrams to 200 milligrams. It's in, it can be useful in uh, varying doses. It's an amino acid that can help to increase serotonin and then melatonin levels. However, best not used if a person is on an antidepressant because of the risk of serotonin syndrome. So it's just the important to be mindful of any interactions with other medications. GABA, another um, natural product, 100 to 500 milligrams can help to deepen sleep. And I also use a lot of L-threonine, 100 to 200 milligrams. And this is the calming part of green tea. And it can be helpful on its own or in combination with the 5-HTP and the GABA. Um, melatonin is also um, very helpful used on its own or in combination. Melatonin is actually an antioxidant and has been used in doses of over 20 milligrams or more in cancer patients. But for sleep, lower doses appear to be more helpful. 
and I've found most benefit with 1.5 to 3 milligrams at night. In fact, I've commonly used a supplement recently which has been helpful. It has 1.5 milligrams of melatonin. It has 5-HTP, L-threonine and some GABA in tart cherry, ju cherry juice, cherry, which uh, has a good effect and helps a lot of people to deepen their sleep and at least, at least get off to sleep. And then I'll often use long-acting melatonin to help them stay asleep. A compounding pharmacy such as we have at NIMS can be helpful in making up some of these products and working out which would be the most effective for individuals. CBD oil, of course, has been found to be very helpful in deepening sleep. And, um, um, and there should be no problem in driving <clears throat> as it has no THC. Doesn't help everybody, but I think um, 70, 75% of people have a good response. I've also used low-dose naltrexone in people with a chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia to reduce intracellular inflammation, and this helps their sleep. So um, I also recommend a lot of allied health practices. I've found infrared saunas are very soothing and calming at night. Sleep tanks, um, sleep tanks are good. And I do like kinesiology, Reiki, reflexology, osteopathy, anything that makes you feel calmer. And I think the benefits are there um, as long as we do something we enjoy. Exercise I haven't mentioned just or in passing, but I do think in the morning it's better to exercise. In the evening it can raise cortisol levels, which in then turn can deplete your melatonin. So I think we mustn't forget, as, a, as my last sort of comment, is the uh, benefits of a healthy belly life. Sometimes just having a good laugh, watching something funny, will help us more than actually looking at all the research, perhaps. And we need to be relaxed to sleep well. So um, thank you. And um, I hope we'll turn it over to David. Or I'll let Amanda introduce. Are you introducing David? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, thank you. That was a long list of um, not only nutritional supplements, but strategies as well, and um, very informative. So. We do. We have had some questions come in, but we might save mm -hmm. those till the end. Um, thank you, Sandra. So, David, um, as I mentioned before, David is a counselling psychologist and sleep specialist, and he's the author of um, a uh, self-help program, uh, Sleep Better Without Drugs, uh, which is a program that he runs over four to six weeks. Um, David's presented a lot of papers on sleep at a number of conferences around the world and um, uh, in terms of uh, his master's and doctoral studies um, through universities of Monash, La Trobe and Swinburne. So thank you for being here this evening and um, looking forward to hearing um, your perspective on um, managing sleep issues. Thank you very much. Um, some of you may be aware that there was a study done not long ago on what happens at Zoom meetings like this. Yeah. And what they found was that at any given moment, 10% of people were listening, 20% were thinking of something else, 20% were asleep, and the other 50% were actively engaged in sexual fantasy. <laughs> so I hope you have a pleasant time. Um, I should say at the start, I have had a sleep problem myself. It was many years ago before I knew anything about sleep. I was writing a book at Boston University uh, and I had 10 weeks to start and finish the book. Uh, and I was working six and seven days a week from eight o'clock in the morning till midnight, go to bed at 12.30, sleep off the worst of it, wake up at two o'clock and then I'd be saying, I've got, to write, I've, got, I've got to sleep, I've got to write this book, I'll never do it for now and so on. And that would happen every couple of hours. I'd wake up and do that. Uh, so I do know what it's like when you can't sleep and you have to. It's awful. And I'm sure that's one of the things that's kept me going all the years that I've been working on sleep. Just a few words about the scientific basis of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and then I'll get straight stuck into it. Uh, I started out writing a, a, a clinical master's thesis at uh, La Trobe University. Uh, tested out a very simple self-help program with 159 people from every state in Australia, found that it worked well. Uh, then a few years later, did a second study, including a follow-up up to 15 months later to see how people were sleeping 15 months later. 
and the success rate 15 months later was 80%. Then there was another independent American study, uh, which I had nothing to do with, somebody else using the Sleep Better Without Drugs self-help program, sent it in the mail to people. The success rate there was 83%. And then a more recent study again, depression and insomnia, which comes first. Uh, and the success rate there in the sleep part of it was 87%. So 80%, 83%, 87%, all very uh, good success rates. The response of the medical profession has been uh, beyond my expectations. The Royal Australian College of GPs was using the program to train GPs. Uh, there are more than 1,000 uh, GPs and more than 1,100 psychologists use the program with their own patients and so on. So uh, it's been very well received. Okay, let me get straight stuck into it. Uh, a few words about the types of insomnia, a few words about the causes, and then I'll be talking most of the time about what you can do to learn to sleep better or to help yourself to sleep better. First of all, the types of insomnia. So a lot of people think that insomnia just means trouble falling asleep. But in fact, as some of you will know, there are many more types than that. There's trouble falling asleep. There's waking up and having trouble going back to sleep or early morning waking. There's waking up frequently during the night. Some people have trouble sleeping well without medication, like many. Uh, excessive thinking and worrying in bed, trouble switching off your mind at night, such a typical cause of sleep problems. Then there's worrying about not sleeping, like I described a moment ago. I've got to sleep, I've got to sleep. Uh, light sleep, non-restorative sleep, irregular or erratic sleep, and in, insomnia associated with chronic pain, with post-traumatic stress, with tinnitus, with menopause, a whole lot of more physical things which can lead to sleep problems. Uh, a few words about the causes of insomnia, and one of the main things to notice here is because there are so many causes, we need lots of treatments. So the first thing you need to do is to rule out physiological causes of the sleep problem. Rule out sleep apnea, restless legs, periodic limb movements in sleep. Uh, if you think you might, sleep apnea being a disorder of breathing in sleep, and the other two, uh, you have a, a kind of twitching uh, or a, a feeling of ants crawling under the skin, bugs in the muscles. If you have any of those things, go to the GP, get referred to a sleep lab, sleep over one night, and you can rule it in or rule it out. So let's say you've ruled it out. Uh, you have common or garden insomnia, and that is uh, something like 2 million people in Australia regularly have trouble sleeping. So you're not alone. Uh, what, are the what are some of the causes of that? First of all, physical tension. So people lying in bed with tight muscles, tight jaw, tight fist. Uh, then there's mental tension, trouble switching off your mind at night. Then for some people, bed becomes associated with not sleep. So bed becomes an activity center where you watch television, look at the social media on the, on the smartphone, work, study, eat, do anything other than sleep. Uh, then there are disturbances to the body clock, including shift work, or for teenagers, it may be that they go to bed at three in the morning and get up at two in the afternoon. Uh, there are environmental disturbances, so light coming in in the morning can wake people up. Noise, including a, sleeping, uh, a snoring partner, can disturb your sleep. The mattress needs to be not too cold, not too hot, uh, sorry, not too uh, soft, not too hard. So a bit of a Goldilocks there. And similarly, with the heat in the room, needs to be not too hot, not too cold, not too stuffy. So lots of Goldilocks type things there. Uh, another cause, stress, a major cause of insomnia. Then there can be life events, divorce, bereavement, car accident, whatever. Uh, depression can be another cause of insomnia. And here, I just want to spend a moment on that. Talk briefly about a man when in the days when I still saw people myself, now the self-help program is still around. It's on the internet, so it's very inexpensive now. Um, but when I used to see people one-to-one, -one, uh, I had one man came to see me. 
who was a, a, a company executive. His problem began 26 years earlier when he was having severe financial problems. He was about to lose his house. So that was a very good reason to lose sleep. But then the financial problems resolved themselves, but the sleep problem continued. So he went to see the doctor and the doctor said, you must be depressed. He said, no, I'm not, you've got a sleep problem, you must be depressed. He said, no, I'm not depressed, I just can't sleep. And the doctor didn't listen to that. So he was given the following antidepressant medications over a period of 20 years, tryptanol, tolvon, deptran, petrofin, prothiodin, lithium, which is for bipolar, marplan, Prozac, and Parnate, and some of those are antipsychotics. When those medications didn't help, he was hospitalized in a psychiatric hospital. When that didn't help, he was given 10 electric shock treatments. He said, in the hospital, we'd sit around watching Rumpole and MASH on television. The people around me who were depressed were crying, but there were two or three of us who were laughing. We knew we weren't depressed. We were just too tired to function. So when that man learned to sleep better, which took about six weeks, as it usually does, he was no longer depressed if he ever was. So if you have depression with a sleep problem, if the depression came first, by all means, treat the depression. But if the sleep problem came first, uh, it's very worthwhile treating the sleep alone. And I have done my third study, the one that I talked about before, uh, discovered that 70% of people who were both depressed and had a sleep problem, once the sleep problem was treated, the depression either totally lifted or it was significantly less. So don't underestimate the power of treating the sleep problem in terms of depression. Next uh, cause of insomnia, anxiety. So uh, worriers are more likely to have uh, sleep problems because they lie in bed worrying. And finally, in capital letters, because it's so important, habit problem. So this is the most common uh, cause of sleep problems of all. Uh, they often start for some understandable reason, which may be a young child kept you up at night, a car accident, a divorce, death of a loved one, accumulate or just an accumulation of stresses and worries at work or at home. And the reason may be long forgotten but the bad sleep continues as a habit. Uh, why does the habit continue? Because you lose confidence in your ability to sleep well. You might start fearing going to bed. You may become tense. You may worry about not sleeping. The body clock may now be wrongly adjusted. So many reasons why the habit can continue. Uh, and to give you just one case example of that, uh, I used to do live sessions when I'd give presentations like this. So this was a woman who volunteered. Uh, I asked her, when did the problem start? She said, I don't know. It was a long time ago. I don't even remember why it started or when it was. So after we'd talked for about 20 minutes, she clicked her fingers and she said, you know what? I've remembered when it started. It was when my daughter was having her 21st birthday party and I couldn't sleep for worrying about the catering. That was 13 years ago. The daughter has long since left home, got children of her own, but the mother is left with the sleep problem. So that's how it works. It can be something as trivial as worrying about the catering for a birthday party, uh, and it can just go on and on for, in her case, 13 years. It can go on for 20 years, 30 years. Okay, now I come to the main item on the agenda, which is what can you do about it? What can you do to help yourself to sleep better? Okay, first of all, I'm talking about a program which is a four to six week program. So there's nothing here that you have to do for the rest of your life, and that's really important. Second general point before we start, if you don't have a sleep problem, keep on doing what you're doing. You don't have to worry about any of this because whatever you're doing is working. If you do have a sleep problem, here are some things you can do. Uh, the program, first of all, helps sleep better without drugs. First of all, helps you to diagnose your sleep problem. And then it gives you more than 50 different things that you can do to help yourself to sleep better. And you find the ones that are important for you. So I'll be going over a lot of them, but I can't go over the, all 50, of course, because we don't have time. Um, what if you've done some of them before? 
what if you've done some of them before? Does that mean it won't work for you? Not at all. Uh, and the example that I use, a bit of an odd one to illustrate that, there was a strike at Rome Airport uh, a number of years ago, and there was a Boeing 737, so one of those planes that carries more than 200 people, was there at the airport, stranded, needed to be pushed about 50 metres away so it could get onto the runway and take off. Now, if you imagine the strongest person in the world, Mr. Universe, tries to push that plane, is he going to manage to push it? Not a hope. You take the second strongest alone, pushes for two days, not a hope. 30 strongest people, one after the other, not a hope. But what happened? There were 15 crew, 15 staff members, and 15 passengers got together, and they pushed that plane together the 50 metres they needed, and it was able to take off. So that's how it works. If you do all the 50 things at the same time, then it has much more power than doing one for a week or two, another for a month or two, another for a year or two. Okay, so as I say, I can't go through all of them, but I'll go through some of the most important ones, and in particular, some of the ones that are less well known. So the first one, not well known at all, relates to the natural sleepiness cycle. It's got a technical name, it's called the Altradian rhythm, but I like to not use technical language, so I call it the natural sleepiness cycle. Sleepiness comes in waves about every 60 to 90 minutes or so, so falling asleep is a bit like surfing. You have to learn to catch the wave of sleepiness. How do you catch the wave? It's when your eyes get heavy, when you start yawning and so on. To help you to see whether you are familiar with these waves, you might have had the experience that you were reading or doing something else. You started to feel sleepy, your eyes were getting heavy, you were starting to yawn, but you thought, I'll just finish this chapter or I'll just finish what I'm doing. And yet by the time you've just finished it, you're not sleepy anymore, you're wide awake again. Uh, or you're driving and you're feeling pretty sleepy and you probably should pull over, but you don't. And you keep on going and half an hour later, you notice, oh, I'm not quite as sleepy as I was before. So that is the natural sleepiness cycle in action. So what you have to do is to learn to catch the wave of sleepiness. And if you miss one wave, you have to wait 60 to 90 minutes for the next one to come. Now, I was giving this workshop recently at Swinburne University, and one of the graduate students there said, you know what, my nonno, so that's her Italian grandfather, my nonno used to say, if you're rushing to the platform to try and catch the train, but you miss it, you have to wait for the next train to come. He was talking about sleep. So that's exactly the same metaphor, except that it's a train rather than a wave. If you miss one wave, you have to wait for the next one to come. And you can learn to catch the wave. Okay, second lot of things that you can do to reduce, uh, to, to uh, learn to sleep better is reduce your thinking and worrying in bed. Such a problem for so many people. And in most sleep programs, I don't know why, but in most sleep programs, they don't talk about it at all. Um, so there are 20, in this one, there are 20 very specific suggestions as to how you can reduce thinking and worrying in bed. Uh, I can't go through all of them, but let me give you at least three. And again, some of the ones that are less well known and most important. First one, most of the thinking and worrying that we do in bed needs to be done. It just doesn't need to be done in bed. It's things like, what did I do today? What have I got to do tomorrow? How am I going to solve this problem? How am I going to solve that problem? They're all things that need to be done. They just don't need to be done in bed. So the idea is set, it, set aside some time during the day, maybe five minutes, maybe an hour, any amount of time, to do all the thinking and worrying that you need to do. Then uh, when it comes to bedtime, if the thoughts come again, as they will, uh, you simply say to yourself, I thought about it today, I'll think about it again tomorrow, I'm just going to sleep now. Now, one man who was a GP who was using the program for his own sleep came back at the six-week follow-up and he said, you know, the first week I thought I was going to go crazy. I was saying it over and over. I thought about it today. I'll think about it tomorrow. I'm just going to sleep now. I thought about it and so on. 
Uh, but he said, but in the second week, I noticed I didn't have to say it as much and my mind didn't click into the thinking and worrying. So that's how it works. You give your mind something else to do and then it gets out of the habit that it's in of doing all the thinking and worrying in bed because that's not a good time to be doing it. it. Makes it hard to sleep. A second of the thinking and worrying in bed reduction things, sometimes it'll be a night when you know it's going to be a terrible night tonight. Uh, you've had a fight with your partner, you've had a really stressful day at work, whatever it is. You know that your mind is going to be clicking into thinking and worrying the moment you hit the bed. So as you're walking towards the bed, you can be saying to yourself, don't even start. Don't even start. So again, you fill your mind with something and that stops it from immediately clicking in to uh, the thinking and worrying. And a third really important one, I think, uh, one which I do myself pretty much every day. Uh, and by the way, uh, people, when I talk to them about thinking and worrying in bed and reducing it, they say, oh, I can't do that. My mind has a mind of its own. Uh, I used to have a mind that had a mind of its own. I've used all these things myself, and my mind now doesn't anymore have a mind of its own. So the third one that I'm suggesting here is uh, one of the things that be, that's really useful is to uh, make a list, not, not in the last hour before bed, but go over what happened during the day and make a list of all the things you need to do tomorrow. Make a list of all the things you need to do tomorrow so that then when you're in bed, uh, when the thoughts come, uh, you can say it's on the list. I'll think about I'll do it tomorrow. I'll think about it tomorrow. If a new thought comes, pen and paper by the bed, write it down, let it go. Okay. Now, uh, the next one I want to talk about is learning not to worry if you're not sleeping. I've got to sleep, I've got to sleep, and so on. So uh, it's probably, I would say, more sleep is lost through worrying about not sleeping than from any other cause. Uh, so instead of saying, I've got to sleep, I've got to sleep, uh, there's some alternative things you can do. What you can say to yourself is, Something like this. What's the worst thing that would happen if I don't sleep at all tonight? I'll be very, very tired tomorrow. That'll be awful, but I won't die from that. In fact, I'll probably make it through the day just as I've always made it through the day in the past. Worrying about it now will only make it worse. So, and now here's the important part. So I'll just lie here and rest now and as long as it is peaceful rest, that'll be nearly as restorative as sleep anyway. I'll just lie here and rest now. And as long as it's peaceful rest, that'll be nearly as good as sleep anyway. Now, why is it nearly as good as sleep? I'll give you an embarrassing example for that. I used to love to take my kids to piano lessons and I would lie down on the floor, close my eyes, listen to them playing a highlight of the week for me. After a couple of months, the word came back, Dad, it's really embarrassing when you snore during our piano lessons. Mm -hmm. I said, who, me, snore? I'm listening to you. It must have been just once. They said, Dad, it's every time. So I'm a sleep specialist. And even I don't know when I'm going in and out of sleep on those waves. So that's what happens. If you are lying there resting peacefully, you will actually be going in and out of sleep on the sleep waves because by definition, by very definition, when you are asleep, you are not conscious of it. So if you can learn to lie there resting peacefully, that's nearly as not, not quite as good as sleep, but nearly as good. Okay, the next thing you can do to help yourself to sleep better is to learn to sleep without medication. Now, sleeping medication can be useful if you use it every now and then once or twice a week, something like that at the most. Uh, but if you use it every night, night after night for weeks, months or years, as so many people do, then there are three main problems. First of all, tolerance builds up. Um, so I worked with one man who was taking eight Mogadon a night. Mogadon, one of the longest lasting and strongest of the sleeping medications. After I put out the self-help program, I worked with another woman who was taking a packet of Rohypnol a night. That's 25 tablets, 
And that generation of Rohypnol, the normal starting dose was half a tablet. So she was taking 50 times the starting dose every night. And she'd been doing that for some years. And both of them, both the man with the eight Mogadon and the woman with the packet of Rohypnol, they were each sleeping about two hours a night. So it was absolutely not working for them. Uh, so that's what I mean when I say tolerance can build up. People ask, you know, where did she get it from? How do you get a packet of Rohypnol a night? She was a nurse. That's how she could do it. Um, Second problem if you take medication every night, night after night for weeks, months, years, is you get side effects. So the most common side effects that people notice is a hangover type of feeling next morning. Other side effects, and I'm talking particularly about the benzodiazepines, so things like temazepam, Euhypnos, Normosin, Mogadon, Rohypnol, Serapax, Muralax, Xanax, Valium, Ducine, Lexitan, it's a whole stable of them, um, Ativan, Dalmay, and Halcyon. There are others now, but they also tend to have rather similar side effects. Um, so with long-term use of these medications, the side effects include nervousness, anxiety, tension, lack of energy, so if you're taking these medications and you have these effects, maybe this is a side effect of the medication. Lack of energy, listlessness, trembling, sweating, aches and pains, difficulty concentrating, headaches, upset stomach, diarrhea, and written on the packet, written on the leaflet in the packet, disturbed sleep and insomnia. So the same medications which can help you to sleep better if you take, more, take them not more than once or twice a week can actually lead to worse sleep. And I'm sure that was the case with those two people I was talking about before who were taking so much medication. And the third effect, and probably the most important one of all, uh, if you uh, have been taking this medication for uh, weeks, months or years, is you get withdrawal effects. So some people say, look, I've been taking this for years and years. It's not helping me. I'm going to throw it down the toilet. Uh, no, not the way to go. If you stop cold turkey like that, then you will get withdrawal effects. And all of those kinds of side effects that I've been talking about will uh, boom. Uh, and you'll, in fact, sleep worse as a result of the withdrawal effects. So what you, it's a really perfidious uh, aspect of the sleeping medications. So what you need to do is to reduce very gradually, always in consultation with the person prescribing the medication. Uh, if you're taking one tablet uh, per night, then go down to three quarters for a week or two, and then half for a week or two, and then quarter for a week or two. And if you're taking more than one, so you have to do it uh, very gradually uh, as well. Okay. Um, now, the next things, things that you can do relate to the sleep scheduling rules. Uh, Sandra mentioned them briefly as well. Uh, the first, and these are often misunderstood and misquoted. What you often hear, I'll say it very softly because it's wrong, okay? What you often hear is go to sleep, go to bed at the same time every night. No, no. What you need to do is get up at the same time every morning and Go to bed only when you're actually sleepy. If you get up at the same time every morning, then you will eventually become sleepy at the same time every night, and then you will find yourself going to bed at the same time every night. But if you try and go to bed at the same time every night or try and go to bed early because you didn't sleep well last night, you're likely to just lie there or you'll sleep off the worst of it and then wake up and not be able to go back to sleep or you'll have very light sleep. So the crucial one is get up at the same time every morning. Uh, no naps during the day. If you have to have a nap, make it a 20-minute power nap, maximum one hour, and ideally around about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, no later. It, the worst nap is falling asleep in front of television or falling asleep in front of whatever screen you're watching uh, and then going to bed, then waking up and going to bed. You've actually... Uh, just slept off the worst of it, even if it's only for five minutes, 
uh, and that makes it much harder to fall asleep. So if you feel yourself getting sleepy when you're on the couch, don't watch the rest of the movie, record it and go to bed, go to sleep. Then there are the stimulus control rules. Um, one which is really important is no screens in the last half hour at least before bed. Um, ideally even a bit more than that, but at least no screens in the last half hour and no waking up in the middle of the night and looking at uh, Facebook. Uh, smart smart uh, phones, nothing to do with, uh, with them during the night. Uh, bed is only for sleep or sex. Uh, and if you're not asleep within about 30 minutes, get up, go to another room, do something boring until you feel your eyes getting heavy and then back to bed, back to sleep. The next lot of things you can do relate to relaxation. Uh, as I've mentioned to you before, lying in bed, resting peacefully, that's a really important thing that you can learn to do. Uh, in the self-help program, there's a 20 minute relaxation. If you haven't got 20 minutes to do relaxation, there's also a one minute relaxation, what I call relaxation for people who don't have time to do relaxation. Uh, then there's a sleep diary. You can keep a sleep diary. It takes you half a minute in the morning and when you wake up and half a minute just before you turn out the lights. Very simple. You can work out. You can become a scientist on yourself. You can work out what helps you to sleep better and what makes you sleep worse how much sleep you need, and you can keep a systematic record of progress over time. Then there's a lot of information about sleep and the sleeping environment. So for instance, tiredness during the day is often the last thing to improve uh, because you often have a backlog of tiredness if you slept badly for a long time. And also different people need different amounts of sleep. Most people need about eight hours. Some people need only seven. Some people need eight and a half. Uh, so you can work out what it is for you. Then there are sleep hygiene things, which uh, Sandra has talked about. So caffeine, ideally, you know, some people can drink a cup of coffee just before they go to bed and it doesn't affect their sleep. So it's very individual. That's why this is a self-help program. Everybody's different. If you think that caffeine is a problem for you, no caffeine from about two o'clock onwards usually and possibly from lunchtime onwards. Uh, alcohol can help you to fall asleep, but the same alcohol will disturb your sleep later that night. Nicotine, people think they have a, a, a puff on a cigarette, it helps them to relax, but it actually is a stimulant. In particular, it's a stimulant for your brain. And so it's very hard to control your thoughts if you're taking uh, too much nicotine too close to bedtime. So I don't say stop smoking, that's one of the hardest things in the world to do, but Try not to have too many cigarettes from about dinner time onwards. And certainly if you wake during the night, don't reach for a cigarette. Exercise, Sandra has said, uh, I say exactly the same. Uh, better to do it in the morning. It's really good uh, for uh, getting you tired out and therefore sleeping better. If you have to do it in the evening, uh, keep a diary. See, does it matter if you do it uh, after you come home from work? Does it disturb your sleep or does it actually help you? Uh, Stressful lifestyle, uh, when people have got sleep problems because of stress, uh, the main, you know, you'd need another, another hour to talk about all of that. But I have learned over the years that the one thing that's the most important in terms of stress, the one question that's the most important is, what are you going to do less of? Usually what happens is you have a pretty full life and then somebody says, I need you to do this. Somebody else says, I need you to do that. Uh, you think, oh, I'd like to do that as well. And all of a sudden, you've got an overfull life. So the, the question is, what are you going to do less of? And, uh, you know, the first answer is, you go, I can't do less of anything. But if you leave your mind open to the possibility that you can do less, you can delegate, then that's really important. And finally, perseverance for four to six weeks uh, in capital letters, because that's really important. Uh, I don't expect you to say, uh, I know this will work for me, but I do hope you might say, I don't know if this will work for me, but I'll give it my best shot for four to six weeks. What have I got to lose? Now, on the next slide, you can see that it's uh, available now on download. 
So instead of costing $100, it's now $9.99 downloadable from sleepbetter.com.au, sleepbetter.com.au. Uh, I think uh, I'll leave it there and uh, leave time for some questions. We might just um, show us the, uh, that's it, there and it the is. final Sleep. slide there is um, the yeah. www.sleepbetter.com.au, as David just mentioned. Um, thank you to David and Sandra for an absolute mind of information, which will <laughs> keep our brains going tonight, I think. But um, I wondered, David, whether um, you talked about uh, people needing, you know, different amounts of sleep. Um, do you think that changes with age? Uh, look, people often think that uh, as you get older, you need less sleep. But in fact, what happens is as you get older, the circadian rhythm, so the 24 or 25 hour day and night cycle becomes flatter. So it's harder to stay asleep at night and it's harder to stay awake during the day. Mm. Um, but the total amount that you need doesn't change. Because, mm. uh, I mean, I guess we all know that teenagers mm. love to sleep in, but maybe that's because they're out. Till, Look, yes, till teenagers out. need mm. more, but once you're 20-odd. Once you're uh, mm. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, when you talk about uh, uh, having an understanding and diagnosing yourself, um, and that sort of self-help uh, strategy, um, I think people will feel very empowered by, um, by having mm. some of that knowledge and being able to put some of those techniques into place. It is one of the beautiful things about a self-help program, that when you make it work, you know, I did this myself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people, I, I had somebody came to me uh, saying, 20 years ago I used this program and it saved my life, were her words. And she said, I want to help you to put up a Facebook page so that uh, other people can learn about this, that mm -hmm. uh, it really should be known, that mm -hmm. you can help yourself. Yes, fantastic. And so there are a number of people who are on medications and you gave us some examples which were um, quite scary in terms of the uh, level uh, mm -hmm. and duration for many people. I'm just wondering, Sandra, if... Um, patients come to you with um, saying, I want to uh, uh, reduce my reliance on um, pharmacological interventions, um, mm. how you kind of approach that with your patients? Mm. Well, you know, that's very common. I think a lot of people are using prescription drugs and there's a lot of adverse side effects, including the fact that some of the benzodiazepines can lead um, to Alzheimer's, I mean, can... You know, there's a lot of inflammation in the brain and taking these uh, particular medications isn't reducing the inflammation. So it's, it's sort of, um, they're working in a way that's perhaps not the healthiest way we can do. So I find often people have sleep problems with taking medication because of their high cortisol. Um, so I find, first of all, you've got to introduce um, things that will help them reduce stress. So that's where I find meditation and mindfulness, their exercise, being out of doors more, you need to introduce all of these self-help and David's, um, I think it would be wonderful to recommend to all patients that they use your program, these sorts of tools before you start to reduce medication. Because you just, a lot of people are depressed and anxious, which is why they're taking medication. We need to support them before we start reducing the medication. As David said, it has to be very gradual. You have to be, particularly antidepressants are so hard for some people to come off. Um, we're just not sure of what they're doing at the cellular level and it's very important to work with that particular patient and offer all the support you can. But I think we need to be very mindful about giving them other tools to help them relax before we start reducing the medication. And it's always important to do quite significant blood testing. A lot of these people are on medication, have perhaps liver and other issues that all need to be addressed and then the medication definitely very slowly. But it takes time and patience. And I think your program sounds a great way to help them do that. And obviously, you know, when you talk about time, that four to six week duration to mm. change those habits um, and see the benefits of those techniques. It's um, perseverance is obviously one of the key yeah. um, strategies in all of that because uh, these things have been going on. And six weeks mm. might sound like a long time, but in the scheme of things, perhaps not. 
That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. It's, uh, you know, if you think that you've had a sleep problem for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, the people I work with, the average in that one of those studies that I did, the average was 13 years. So uh, plenty of 30s and 40s. Um, and you don't change a habit over many years in a week or two. It usually takes four to six weeks. Some people get improvement the next day. It's amazing once they latch onto what they need to do. But I always, I prefer to under promise and over deliver. Uh, I think, you know, start out assuming it'll take four to six weeks. Um, and, uh, you know, if you do the full four to six weeks, you have every chance to get the 80, 83, 87% uh, success rate. So thank you to both of you for um, uh, taking the time this evening and preparing your presentations. There is a lot of information in there. We will put the information up on the um, on the NIM website. Uh, that'll be up in, probably in another uh, few days' time, probably an edited version. Uh, we did have a few technical difficulties at the beginning, so apologies for that. Um, so uh, yes, we'd just like to thank again, Sandra and David, and um, hope you have a good sleep this evening. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs> thank you.